Welcome to presentation number seven in our series, Rereading Revelation. And we are rereading. I have presented under this title before, but many of the things we are saying now are new. <clears throat> and as you can see, number seven is a continuation of the one we did previously, the message to the seven believing communities and to the one who has an ear. So we're going to look at those messages uh, in Revelation 2 and chapter 3. <clears throat> we read this already in the previous presentation. Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven believing communities, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> And here in the Jews Apocalypse, we have the message, we have the seven believing communities, and we have John who is commissioned to write. But we also have this phrase occurring with each of the seven messages. Everyone, just like a mantra, and <clears throat> it personalizes the message, doesn't it? Let the one who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying. And the same whole phrase, but I have <coughs> abbreviated it here, to Smyrna, let the one who has an ear hear. 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 And to the Odyssey, or at the end, let the one who has an ear hear. And we are reading this almost 2,000 years later, and it doesn't seem inappropriate to feel that it is a message directed and individualized for us. <clears throat> so, to anyone who has an ear, or to the one who has an ear, yes, we have seven communities, and they, but they reflect a totality. It isn't a specific number, it is the number of completion, but it is not <clears throat> the complete number and the seven community, it could be seen as a message to the church universal. And <clears throat> anyone who has an ear here with a, an ear magnified to make sure uh, we, the, that is the organ of interest, as it were. <clears throat> So to the one who has an ear includes anyone who has an ear, meaning that a time and place bound message become, becomes timeless and placeless. We can appropriate it here. We can take advantage of it and benefit from it here. <clears throat> this appeal to the, to the sense of hearing means that the message's place demands on the hearing of the recipient. What matters is not only what is said, but also what is heard. It is as though the message delegates responsibility to the hearer to hear it correctly. <clears throat> so hearing itself is not enough, and what is said may not always be self explanatory. <clears throat> there is a pattern to these messages, every, all the messages to whom, from whom, then there is an audit, an assessment, there is counsel, there is a call to the one who has an ear, and there is a promise. <clears throat> and the audit and the counsel is is couched or formulated in medical terms, so it's like a diagnosis and a prescription. It is not so much a legal assessment as a medical assessment, as though uh, uh, Jesus is a, a, a physici physician. And <clears throat> then there is a feature in the, on the from whom side that the message uses a description of Jesus, a portion of a description of Jesus found in the chapter one. So here, 
uh, he has the two-edged sword in this message. <clears throat> and then in the promise section, there is a promise that uses images from chapters 20 to 22. And here we go to the end of Revelation. There is the throne of God and the Lamb. There is the river of life, the tree of life. And portions of those images are used in the promise section. So we see that the rereader of Revelation has an advantage <clears throat> because you could not you could not get the full meaning of those promises except <clears throat> to, uh, as you have read the whole thing. <clears throat> so in my commentary, here in the Paideia commentaries uh, that, uh, that I have contributed to, um, so I, my first sentence, my opening sentence in the messages to the believing communities is, beware of hyperbole. And hyperbole is a form of ordinary speech. It is intentional exaggeration. The, uh, the person who does hyperbole is not lying. He is exaggerating to make a point. And we all consider it quite legitimate. And here are some examples. He is running faster than the wind. He isn't, but he's running very fast. The bag weighs a ton. It doesn't. It weighs 20 pounds. <clears throat> it's a heavy bag, relatively speaking. This is the worst day of my life. Well, there are many days that are called the worst day of my life. So <clears throat> it's a figure of speech. My dad will kill me if he gets to know. <laughs> he won't, <laughs> but he won't like it. <clears throat> Your skin is softer than silk. Wonderful skin. And the metaphor is easy to understand. And this one, you're the best doctor in the world. And I have had patients who have told, who have told me that. <laughs> it isn't true. <laughs> I have been a decent doctor. But it's nice of them to say it. They mean to say something nice to you. So this is hyperbole, intentional exaggeration. And when we do the book of Revelation, we need to take that into consideration. So here is an <clears throat> yet another image. She cried so long that she made a lake. <clears throat> she probably didn't, but she cried <clears throat> hard, and it was, it was uh, 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 some grief that was uh, unusual. Let's take a look how this works in the context of Revelation, how hyperbole might work. <clears throat> and here you see, I'm asking, do we have many problems? Or do we have one problem with many names? It's the naming that is confusing. It's actually simpler than we think. So <clears throat> here in two communities, we have Nicolaitans. Lots of scholarly work has been done to find out who they might be, what they represent. But at least we see that we have this problem group in two places. So we have the same problem in two places. Let's <clears throat> do another one. Here in the place in Pergamum where there are Nicolaitans, there's always someone, there's also someone who holds to the teaching of Balaam. So now our question is, is that two problems or is this, or is it the same problem under two different names? It's far more likely that it is the latter. Same problem, two different names, and the teaching of Balaam. Balaam is a very negative person in the Old Testament. So the use of that term should be seen as hyperbole, intentional exaggeration. Let's look at another one. <clears throat> Here we have in Ephesus some who claim to be apostles and they're that's falsely. And here in Thyatira, there is one who claims to be a prophetess. That's also uh, not so. So apostles here, prophetess here, two different problems or the same problem under two different names. More likely 
the latter. <clears throat> we have sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols in Pergamum and in Thyatira. Uh, no, yes, that's right. So, do we, are these two different problems or are they the same problem under two different names? And also a tendency to hyperbole. It is unlikely that in these small communities that there were someone who promoted actual sexual immorality. So that is a term for some kind of erosion in the community. And <clears throat> we can see this in another way. And here is another point that I wish to, to emphasize. So here we have in Ephesus some who say about themselves that they are apostles, but they aren't. And here, Smyrna, some that say about themselves that they are Jews, but aren't. This one we looked at already, someone who says she's a prophetess, but isn't. And here in Philadelphia, again, someone who say they are Jews, but are not. So, the, <clears throat> these I propose, I suggest, are different names for the same problem. There is a problem in these communities described in this way. The apostles here and the Jews here are the same, have the same valence, the same type of category. The Jews are not ethnic Jews. They are not what they are, say they are, but the Jews that are not Jews are not ethnic Jews. See, those who are, it's not saying here that they are Jews, but they aren't, you know, that they pretend to be ethnic Jews or something like that. That isn't the case. So, so the importance of this or changing the labels here, or at least understanding the labels here, we shall see every, uh, I will uh, look at that one more uh, in more closely in a minute. I just want to do one more thing here. <clears throat> so we have four times reference to Satan, synagogue of Satan, throne of Satan, deep things of Satan and synagogue of Satan here. So there is some threat to the community and it is labeled in the harshest way you can imagine. We can imagine. And there is that cosmic conflict tenor to it of a, of a threat to the community uh, from the other side, from, from Satan. And deep things of Satan suggest some level of sophistication to it. And the communities need to beware and pay attention to it. But in all of these terms, there is a sense of hyperbole. And that is a challenge to readers. <clears throat> so let's specify it here in Thyatira. There is someone re referred to as the woman Jezebel. And she is the most notorious figure just about in the Old Testament. So it's a very strong term. Is there really someone inside the faith community in Thyatira who is the equivalent of Jezebel? Or is this intentional uh, intentional exaggeration, what I call hyperbole. <clears throat> so is it literal or figurative? It is figurative, clearly. And then in uh, Pergamum, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. So Balaam is almost as bad as Jezebel. So these are strong terms for whatever is going on there. But maybe more important is how we figure, how we find out who they are. So those who hold the teachings of Balaam, will we know who they are by communal inquisition? Let's say the church board or some other group sits down and reckons with the problem group. Or will we only know it by introspection? Those who hold the teachings of Balaam, do they know who they are? And the others who don't hold those teachings, do they also know it? Or are these 
things that can be known accessed only by introspection and not by inquisition. Now the church, the Christian church, early on chose the path of inquisition. Maybe not such a good idea. And that's why I'm saying beware of hyperbole. Here the term synagogue of Satan, we have it twice in two places. It's a very strong label and <clears throat> it is quite <clears throat> dangerous to label something. It could be even, or we could even call it name calling. And it could sometimes be misrepresent, <laughs> that we misrepresent someone, that we label people unfairly, unjustly, and create communal turmoil by doing that, whatever uh, our own local situation might be. <clears throat> it is obviously quite serious when you think about the Jewish synagogues through history and how these communities have been vilified and how biblical terms, biblical books including the book of Revelation, has been, have been used to label and to vilify uh, communities of faith. So <clears throat> that's why I'm saying, I hope I make myself understood, <laughs> beware of hyperbole. It's not unimportant. <clears throat> well, we are ready to tour the believing communities. We're not doing the cities now, we're doing the communities, but I am showing the city again, and you might recognize that this is Ephesus. And so we will circle it again, and then we will <clears throat> take away Imperial Ephesus, and we will go to the Deuce Apocalypse. Uh, and the there is one different illustration for each of the believing communities. And we will look at what uh, the message here and I cannot do everything for each uh, community, but let's do one, this one uh, or this excerpt. I know your works, positive, your toil, positive, and your patient endurance, all positive. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers, also positive, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And we could take many things away from this, but I just want to do one thing here. How the person here, the heavenly speaker here, talks in a different way <clears throat> than Roman religions. Roman religions, Roman imperial policy, or Roman religious policy, they <clears throat> were not interested in what the Romans believed. And they were not interested in how they felt so what's your belief system? What's your, uh, you love your God. That's not important in that context. They're just interested in whether you participate. I mean, like you celebrate the 4th of July, something like that. Not anything that is deep. But here it goes deep. He is interested in what we believe. And he is interested in how we feel about it. I have left, you have left your first love. <clears throat> we go on to Smyrna and we read here, there wasn't much we remember to see in Smyrna and we go to the <clears throat> Deuce Apocalypse and we want to hear what he says here and this is what he says. <clears throat> I know your, inflic your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander from those who say that they are Jews but are not, and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This very strong uh, description uh, uh, of, of, of the problem here. So when Jesus says, I know the slander, he doesn't just mean that he understands the slander that they are, exp that they are uh, uh, exposed to. He knows the slander personally because he was its first victim in the context of the cosmic conflict. 
when someone started talking badly about God and misrepresented God. I know from personal experience the slander. And then when you refer to something as the synagogue of Satan, it means the phenomenon of Satan, the sort of uh, <clears throat> the type of work that Satan has been doing uh, through, the, uh, through aeons. That's what we might uh, take away from it. So let's move on. We move on now to, to uh, uh, Pergamum here. So, and the Deuce Apocalypse has Jesus with the two-edged sword in his mouth. He is the true witness and the message to Pergamum. And we remember that was a very impressive city. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. Again, there is Satan represented in the neighborhood. He lives in your neighborhood. Yet you are holding fast to my name. And you did not deny my faithfulness, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan lives. <clears throat> so is this Satan's throne in Pergamum? So Pergamum, now we know where he lives, and we're happy he's not in our neighborhood. When he's in all the neighborhoods, of course, it's a figure of speech. And... Antipas, who was killed, whatever, whatever reference we make to that or, or, or his character, we should think of it more like this. Satan's throne is not a location, but an ideological construct. Someone who uses violence against other people. Someone who uses violence, who persecutes and even kills. So that's Satan-type work, Satan's uh, quality, and it shouldn't be taken to be location. That's my point here. Okay, we're moving on to Thyatira. There wasn't much in Thyatira, we remember, but the Jews <coughs> apocalypse has Jesus represented like this. And this is what he says. I know your works, <clears throat> your love, faithfulness, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. And the point here is <clears> that <throat> this is in contrast to, to uh, Ephesus, where there was a declining sort of temperature uh, tenor. And here they go from good to better. One doesn't always have to go down. One can sometimes go up, and this community is of that kind. So that <clears throat> is Thyatira. And then we move on to Sardis. And Sardis was a big, important city. But we are not interested in that. We are interested in the community. This is how... It's uh, <clears throat> represented here, and you can see the hand movements of the speaker. It's quite, quite uh, significant. There is a kind of signal already in the body language. I know your works, that you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So this is a very serious and sobering message, and we will... <laughs> linger a little in Sardis and look at the problem here because <clears throat> here is a reputation meter. So the message that Sardis has a good reputation and then to be told that reputation is not a reliable measure of quality. And <clears throat> so they score high on the reputation meter but there is no help in that. And, of course, that could mean that the message they get is quite a surprise. And I am asking, what is the remedy for the problem of an undeserved good reputation? It's not easy to fix because the input is so flattering, so positive. And then how 
what is the remedy then? We look, remember <clears throat> then what you have received and heard and keep and turn. And that's kind of a personal message to remember, to think back and to recall and maybe to, to uh, do a reset in life. In my <clears throat> commentary, I, uh, I mean to use an illustration similar to Augustine who says in the Confessions, that you, God, you put me in front of myself and somehow stood me up in front of myself. And I did an assessment that it was quite, quite a change, quite a discovery. So I am suggesting in my commentary that in Sardis, there are no specifics. The evidence for the problem there can be accessed only accessed only by memory and introspection. And God and the believer will have to sort it out in the private sphere, not by inquisition, but by introspection, I suggest. And they will have to do this against the societal verdict that gives the believers every reason to feel good about themselves. It isn't easy to do but it is doable, or we would not be doing this exercise and there would be no message to the community in Sardis except for the hope that there is a remedy. <clears throat> we go on to Philadelphia where there isn't much to see, so we are skipping that, but the Deuce of Apocalypse <coughs> is particularly key, uh, uh, sort of precise on this one. Someone here with the key of David who opens and no one will close. And there is an open door in front of John. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door which no one can shut. No one is able to shut. That is to say, I am lowering the threshold. I'm making it easier for you. I am fighting on your side of the playing field. That's what it means. <clears throat> and then the last one, again, to Laodicea. And we remember that there is much to see there, but we are interested in <clears throat> the messages to the communities. And here the Deuce Apocalypse, there is a pointing with a finger. So the hand movements might also here be significant. And the message is quite strong. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. And then <clears throat> he goes on, <clears throat> thus because you are lukewarm and neither cold, hot nor cold, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. And nausea and vomiting, nausea is a is a side effect of medications that I have had to deal with in, in, my, um, in my medical work. And we have all experienced that nausea is a visceral feeling, a visceral state. So this is something off-putting, sort of off uh, that turns, turns Jesus off about this community. <clears throat> and we linger in Laodicea like we lingered in Sardis. And we see this feeling good about yourself. And then we read what the Laodiceans say. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and have need of nothing. Rich, prospered, need of nothing. Those are strong claims. And, and then the observation from the speaker here. Uh, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So the assessment from above differs tremendously from the self-assessment of the community. And <clears throat> this seems to be reality because the speaker says you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, uh, and we see that that is an insight that 
is hard. It's a hard sell when the self-assessment of the community is so positive. So how do you do this again? And <clears throat> most likely we will have to, to uh, do the same here as in Sardis, that these are matters that you can only do by introspection and by believing in the doctor, by believing that the person who makes the diagnosis knows what he is talking about and that there is no risk believing him because he offers a remedy with his diagnosis. <clears throat> so by way of summary here, <clears throat> heaven takes a keen interest to the one who has an ear, whether they live back then, whether we live here right now. Uh, heaven takes a keen interest in the heavenly outposts. The communities are critical to the mission. Revelation's use of hyperbole. I wish I could say more about this, but there is a kind of hyper-particularity and hyper-specificity to these messages that fall into the bag of hyperbole. <clears throat> that phenomenon is poorly recognized by readers, including scholars. I think they have misperceived uh, some of those messages. And <clears throat> Satan is mentioned in four of the messages and implied in the other three. A demonic force is at work, determined to dim the light of the community and destroy the lighthouse. It's crucial. Sardis, <clears throat> number four, we lingered there, remember? And Laodicea, we lingered there. Sardis with its good, good reputation and Laodicea <clears throat> with its with its distorted self-image, they have in common lack of the sense of need. <clears throat> and Laodicea, by some criteria we have not specified, Laodicea is found lacking precisely in the areas of which it is most proud and on which it has built its reputation. Number five, considering Revelation as a whole, then, it will not be wrong to say that in God's eyes, all I need is need. And my last one, at the beginning of the seven messages, the communities are audited with respect to the mission. At the end, Jesus cannot hide the longing of largely unrequited love. And let's look at this closing image from the message to the Laodicean community. Jesus is talking, look, I have taken up my position in perfect tense at the door and I stand there knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to eat with him or her and he, she with me. So, <clears throat> looking at the image here, at the end of Revelation, at the end of the messages to the seven communities in Revelation, we hear knocking on the door. 